Hi everyone and welcome back to High School Science 101. I imagine that you've shivered before, or you've sweated, or you've touched something hot or painful and pulled your hand away, or you've seen something scary and then you've screamed. These are all responses to things and this is what we're talking about today. Let's get started. Alright, so firstly we need to talk about a thing called homeostasis. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment inside your body. What does that mean? Let's go through a few different examples. Let's look at temperature, body temperature. Your body likes to stay at around 37 degrees Celsius and it will do everything it can behind the scenes to ensure that it remains more or less at 37 degrees Celsius. If your body detects that maybe you're getting a bit too hot, you start to sweat. Um, you might start to uh, get red in the face, which is vasodilation. Uh, your, your capillaries in your cheeks will start to dilate and get bigger and fill with blood. And the idea behind that is that it will help you cool down because the blood is closer to the surface of your skin. Uh, when you look at elephant ears, those big African elephant ears are full of blood vessels and blood capillaries. And that's uh, an evolutionary adaptation to try and cool them down because if the blood's closer to the surface, it has an opportunity to cool itself down a lot more effectively. So when we're hot, we sweat, we get red, and these are things that our body does in order to try and cool it down, to try and bring the temperature down internally from something higher down to closer to 37 degrees. Likewise, if you're feeling a bit too cold, your body starts to shiver. Your brain, in fact, the hypothalamus, which is an area inside your brain, it's kind of like your thermostat, and I like to think of it as like a police officer that just makes sure that everything in the body is working as it should. And if it detects that something isn't working properly, then it starts to implement some things and uh, release some, some chemicals and talk to certain glands and muscles to make sure that things can get back on track. So, as I was saying, if you're feeling cold, your hypothalamus detects that from skin receptors and then it starts to tell your muscles to shiver. And of course, when you're shivering, your muscles are contracting and that's generating heat to try and lift your body temperature up to that ideal range of around 37 degrees. So temperature regulation is one example of homeostasis, our maintenance of a constant internal environment. Another example that I'd like to use is conservation of water and water management inside your body. When you're dehydrated, it doesn't make sense to be releasing or urinating unnecessary water. You want to hold on to that water as much as you can. So what happens is if you're dehydrated, your hypothalamus, the area in the brain that I was talking about, that detects that and, and then it sends a signal to the pituitary gland, which is a gland also inside the brain and it tells the pituitary that we're dehydrated, we need to do something here, release ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And so the pituitary obeys the hypothalamus and it sends ADH to your kidneys. Your kidneys are responsible for controlling the amount of water that you're losing through your urine. And so once they receive ADH, antidiuretic hormone, from the pituitary through the bloodstream, your kidneys then uh, given that instruction, let's hold on to this water as much as we can. And so you produce much less urine as a result and more concentrated urine because urine essentially is you or your body releasing wastes, unnecessary wastes out of your body. So if you have less water diluting that waste, then you have more concentrated waste inside that urine. So your urine will probably appear a bit more yellow uh, and a darker yellow when you're dehydrated. All right, so that's a very brief overview of homeostasis using two examples, temperature regulation and water regulation. So now let's link that to a psychological concept called stimulus response. And a stimulus is something that elicits a response. For example, if someone throws a ball at you, your retinas in your eyes perceive this ball coming towards you 
and that information is being sent to your brain. Your brain makes sense of this. It quickly decides, yes, there's a ball here. It's coming towards me. I need to do something about it. And then it elicits a response. And that response, if a ball is coming towards you, will most likely be put up your hands and catch that ball. So the stimulus is the ball coming towards you. The response, putting the hands up and catching that ball. Let's now apply this stimulus response model to the temperature regulation example that I used for homeostasis. If you're in a hot environment, your thermoreceptors in your skin are detecting that, yeah, it's hot outside. That information is being sent through your nerves into your spinal cord and then up to your brain. Your hypothalamus is processing that and, de and deciding what to do with that information. And if it is sufficiently hot, your body will then start to sweat. That's the response. The stimulus is the heat or the detection of heat and the response would be the sweat. Uh, likewise, if you're feeling cold, your skin or your thermoreceptors in your skin are sending that information to your brain. Your brain's making sense of that and deciding what to do as a response. And the response would generally be, I'm going to grab a jacket and put a jacket on because I'm feeling cold. The stimulus is the temperature and the response would be put on a jacket. Some stimulus response models can appear quite simple, but when you look into them a bit further, they're actually more complicated than you think. Let's stick with this temperature example here. If I'm feeling hot and feeling dehydrated, that's becoming a stimulus. My brain is, is deciding that, yeah, okay, there's not enough water here. I need to do something about this. So the response might be to get a glass of water. So your stimulus is, I'm hot, I'm dehydrated, I'm thirsty. The response is to get up out of your seat, walk over to the sink, get a glass out of the cupboard, fill up the glass full of water and have a drink. That's actually quite a complex process or sequence of events from that initial stimulus of feeling dehydrated. So sometimes the models are quite simple. Sometimes there's a fair few steps involved. So we've looked at a simple stimulus response and then a little bit more complicated one, let's now take it another step further. Let's say, for example, you feel something on your shoulder. So the mechanoreceptors in your skin, which are responsible for detecting pressure, they're being triggered and that's sending information to your brain. That's the stimulus, that feeling of something on your shoulder. Your response would then be to turn your head and look at it. So that's stimulus response number one. That can then trigger another stimulus response model. Let's say, for example, it's a spider on your shoulder. So you turn your head, you look at the spider, and now that's another stimulus. Your brain's making sense of this, and if you're scared of spiders, your response might be to scream. So you had one stimulus response triggering another stimulus response. So I could keep going, but I think generally you get the idea now. Let's finish up now by looking at one last type of stimulus response model called reflexes. And reflexes are special because they don't necessarily involve the brain. They're fairly automatic. So let's look at a hypothetical scenario. You're cooking away at your stove, you've got a hot frying pan, and your hand accidentally bumps the hot frying pan. What happens is, and you might have been in this situation before, as soon as your hand hits that pan, your hand pulls away without you even being aware of it. What's happening is, when your hand hits the pan, you've got pain receptors in your skin called nociceptors. They get triggered. They send a, a pain message through your sensory pathway, through your sensory neurons. And then instead of that message going up to your brain and then your brain processing it, generating a command and then sending that command down to your arm, that would take a bit of time. What happens is the sensory pathway connects to a relay neuron in your spinal cord Instead of going up to your brain, it just connects to a relay neuron and then that connects directly to the motor pathway and then it can activate your muscles to contract and pull away before you even know about it. You only know about it after the fact, after your brain's had time to really process what's happened. And so reflexes are a fantastic way for our body to get out of trouble as quickly as possible. I've got a piece of Lego here because if you've stepped on one of these, you'll know that that's the worst possible pain known to mankind. And that is also an example of a reflex response. As soon as your foot touches or steps down on that Lego piece, it triggers the nociceptors in your skin. 
that sends a pain signal up to your spine where that major nerve from your leg connects to the, uh, the column in your spinal cord. And then instead of going up to your brain, it triggers the relay neuron, which then connects to the motor pathway and then tells your muscles to contract. And then afterwards, you scream out in agony. So that's it for today, guys. We looked at homeostasis, which was the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And we linked that to two different examples, water regulation and temperature regulation. We also looked at stimulus response models. For example, if someone throws a ball towards you, that's the stimulus. Your response might be to put your hand up and catch that ball. And then we finished up by looking at reflexes, which is a very automatic type of stimulus response model. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.